I want to welcome Kathy and thank you for being our first one today. Um, <laughs> Kathy is an archaeologist at California State Parks um, at the Southern Se uh, Service Center and she's also been volunteering at the center for the last couple of years. We have her to thank for our wonderful new website we she built for us last year. So if anybody needs any web design skills, she's she's your lady for that as well. Um, <laughs> Today, she's going to give her presentation, and then as far as questions, we're going to use the raised hand, the raise your hand feature, so you can find that in kind of one of your menu bars, and then Dante will facilitate those questions. So once you're asked to ask your question, you're going to just do it live, and then feel free to have an open discussion if that's what, what happens, and you can mute and unmute yourself as needed, um, and I think... Last thing is we're not, we won't be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions, we won't be looking at that. So make sure your questions aren't in chat and you use the raised hand feature. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Kathy. Great, thank you. It's great to be back at the ARC Center, even though we're all doing this virtually, but um, I really appreciate the opportunity to do this. Um, originally, um, I wanted to do this presentation at the SCA conference, and as many of you know, uh, that has been can that was canceled due to the situation. So it's good to have an opportunity to do this. Uh, just to give you a little background of why I picked this topic, um, it's actually kind of relevant right now with all the disinfecting that we're doing. Um, like, why would I choose uh, bleach as a topic? Um, and it's, uh, I was at the Whaley House um, Field School in 2011, and there were lots of those amber bleach bottles that maybe some of you have seen in different places. And so I thought that was significant, so I wanted to kind of look into that more. Also, I have a little bit of a background in marketing. Um, I worked for San Diego State for um, many years, and I was the chair of the marketing program, um, the chair of the marketing committee, and I also did um, website design and also instructional design. So I was kind of involved a little bit in the uh, marketing side. And um, I don't know about you all, but um, it's so interesting to look at these old vintage ads for different products. And uh, it's just, it's kind of a different world really. So you look at some of the, the advertising copy, new and exclusive. It's really hard to imagine that something like Clorox could be something new and um, they'd have to tell us how to use it. It's easy to use. It's a slenderizing body, uh, bottle, body, <laughs> see, reading into it. Important news for housewives. It's a positive advance in the science of housekeeping. So women were not only housekeeping, but they were also the scientists of the home. They were able to um, take this product and um, they were able to disinfect with their knowledge of the house and how to keep it clean. Uh, so there's, there's a picture of the Whaley House, the front of the Whaley House. It's in Old Town, San Diego on San Diego Avenue. And it was built in 1855 by Thomas Whaley. And as I mentioned before, there was a field school from 2007 to 2011, uh, sponsored by San Diego State, and I did the 2011 uh, year. And I looked at 10,000 pieces of glass uh, for my thesis and also for my internship. And uh, there were many of these um, bottles, these amber bleach bottles, either broken or we had several that were that were intact. Um, so there was something definitely going on here um, about the bleach. So I wanted to investigate it a little bit more. So my research questions that I came up with to investigate was, when was bleach introduced as a consumer product? Who used it in the Whaley House? When was it used? Why was it used? And did it increase in exposure to advertising correlate with increased bleach consumption? So just to kind of go over a quick timeline of where bleach came from in the first place, uh, going all the way back to 1785, uh, they found it was useful for bleaching clothing. Uh, back in the day before this, uh, they would just put their clothing out in the sun, maybe mix it with some lime, and that was really the only way to get clothes white. 
1820, they found, or in that general time span, they found that it was a good disinfectant for hospitals and for food processing. And then um, Louis Pasteur came up with his germ theory. Uh, this was something that was really hard for people to buy into at first. Uh, people thought that disease was caused by something in the air. They couldn't believe that it was something very small. Um, it ha should have a smell to it and germs didn't necessarily have a smell to it. So it was really hard for people to buy into it. You even see stories up in the, from the 1920s in the newspaper where uh, people were questioning uh, pasteurized milk. They thought it would take the flavor out of it. So even in the 1920s, people were not buying into the, this pasteurization idea. So in 1913, 1914, Clorox came out. Its sales were really dismal the first year. So they knew they had to do something to try to get the public to buy into this. Uh, so in 1916, they started giving away samples. And by 1920s, they started doing targeting market, targeted marketing. And they would target American housewives in different media, such as the radio, as you may know, the, the radio advertised a lot of um, soaps and detergents and um, bleach specifically. So uh, as uh, the radio ownership increased, um, it had a lot more exposure and sales started to go up. So um, now 2018 and present day, sales for just Clorox alone is a $6 billion industry. And uh, you can look at studying these advertisements and maybe even, you know, Clorox itself different ways. Um, you could probably look at it definitely as a, like a feminist perspective or, or race or gender. Uh, but since I was kind of involved in marketing and business anyway, I decided to use uh, consumer behavior theory, which is something they use in the marketing department. And um, so I was really interested in finding out why consumers behave why they do in relation to um, archaeology and these products that we see that are brand name. Um, one of the interesting ideas was this idea of the reference group. So it's also called consumer tribes in some of the marketing literature. Uh, people want to be like the people in the product advertisement. So maybe they want to be smarter, prettier, a better housewife. Um, I even have an example later where people are, uh, you could, it suggests that you could be more patriotic by using this product. Um, another concept that they use is the condition product association. So by always showing the product with a particular image, uh, we get the idea that this product will actually um, make you into the person that you see or or could be like a mascot or any other type of thing make you into this type of person um, as humans were very susceptible to symbolism and finding meaning in things that maybe aren't um, very maybe aren't very explicit um, they're very um, implicit so there's kind of like this um, this under there's some meaning underneath these advertising over and above what they're trying to do to sell the product. So um, one of more sim my simple question is who was at the Welly house during the time period that bleach was being consumed? So Lillian Welly and Mabel Welly were uh, librarians at the uh, San Diego Public Library and Frederick, uh, Mabel Welly was uh, Lillian's niece and her husband was Frederick James, and Frederick James worked for uh, Wells Fargo Express, which is now Federal Express. So it's kind of like the early days of Federal Express. And um, they were told by advertising that the whiter the shirt, the better. So as professionals, they were expected to live up to that standard. Uh, so with um, some um, tools, I was able to get a really tight absolute date range for the, um, the bottles. And uh, Clorox has a really good dating, bottle dating guide on the website. And it'll show even between a couple years, they changed the embossing, they changed the uh, stippling on the base, the, um, the embossing on the neck, and the shoulders, all these different things, you're able to get a really tight date of when that bottle came from. And then also there was the uh, Latchford marble and the Duraglass maker's marks. 
Uh, so I was looking at 12 embossed uh, bleach bottles, a minimum of 12. And uh, cleaning products represented about 7% of the bottles. So out of 10,000 pieces of glass, 191 were identical by contents, 14 were cleaning products, and 12 were bleach. Um, so like I said, it was 7% 7, 7 of the total identifiable bottles. So this outnumbered um, all the different categories, even outnumbered by liquor and essential items such as food and medicine. Um, oh, I forgot to mention also 1953 was my end date because uh, Lillian passed away in 1953 and the Wally House was left vacant. Uh, so you can see in this ad, it paints a really specific picture. Um, hopefully you can see the entire ad. Um, you might have to use the move the screen around, but um, there's like a little fairy and there's a white magic bleach where the fairy is touching her magic wand to these very white linens. Uh, you have the, the husband who almost looks like a fatherly figure, uh, this very slim housewife, and she's very proud of her white, white linens. Um, it says, um, you'll be proud of your finest linens kept so lovely and white with the aid of white magic. And um, as I was suggesting before, there was an ad that I don't have a picture of, but um, it was just mainly about the copy. And it says, your health, everybody's health, is an important factor in America's tremendous production program. You can help protect health by making laundry Clorox clean. So even though the housewife was not away on combat, um, she might have not been in the factory making aircraft. If she was at home, she was also doing something to help her country. She was keeping her family, uh, her house clean and her family healthy. So she was doing something for the country as well. During, and this is the advertisement during World War II. Oh, so there was other things going on at the same time um, as the date range for the bottles. So in 1930, there was a question on the US census about radio ownership. In 1930, the Whaleys did not own a radio, but surely by 1940-1950, they did own a radio. Um, also, radio advertising sales skyrocketed during that same time. Um, and magazines, women's magazines, even though they had been around since the 1800s, we see a um, increase in the sales of magazines. A lot of these had color or at least illustrated ads for uh, products that women could buy. And a lot of them had the, a description, it made pictures of a referent group of something that women could look, a person they could look at and want to be more like. Uh, Clorox sales went from barely not no sales and uh, skyrocketed through the 1940s and um, until the 1960s sales were in the $40 million range. So um, it, you can decide for yourself whether there was a correlation between all these things that are happening and the date range of the bleach bottles. So hopefully um, you'll see my paper in the SCA proceedings and then you can read um, a little bit more about the statistics and the other things that were going on at the time. So to conclude, um, there was an increase in bleach consumption linked to marketing campaigns aimed at women um, in the 1920s to the 1950s. Uh, the consumption of brand, ble brand name bleach took place between 1937 and 1953 at the Whaley House. And moving into 2020 and beyond, I think there's a need to look at how marketing influences consumption. Uh, what is the archaeological record going to look like um, in the future? That was the question that was posed by the, the SCA conference. Um, so uh, it, we're definitely going to see a tremendous uptick in the number of uh, bottles and everything else. Um, so I'm curious to hear what you might be thinking um, about this link between marketing and the archaeological record. Thank you, Kathy, for your presentation. 
We are now going to move into the discussion Are portion. You down right now because you if, if you would like to ask, a, if you'd like to ask a question, we ask that you use the raise your hand feature in the partic under participants. If you would like to just go ahead and, and make a comment, once the questions have been asked, you may go ahead and just unmute yourself and um, make your comments. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, Tim Gross. Yeah, what uh, you had mentioned other cleaning products, uh, I think. What other kinds of cleaning products did you see in the same time period? Uh, the other two bottles were ammonia. Oh, my. Oh. <laughs> There's a whole lot of cleaning going on in that Whaley house. <laughs> Not sure. Indeed. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts about? what our trash is going to look like uh, from this pandemic. Yes, and I thought about, especially with the connection to Clorox, we're going to be seeing all these Clorox wipes, which I'm sure have some sort of thing that is not going to be biodegradable for a thousand years, like some <laughs> sort of plastic thing. <laughs> I mean, the containers that they're in. Um, I lose my mask every day. I'm sorry to say. I don't know about you guys, but I cannot seem to get the keep the mask on my face or I take it off or I put it on my chin and then I get home and I can't find it. So, and I see masks everywhere now and I'm sure they have all kinds of plastic and they're not biodegradable. So it's, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see what that strata <laughs> is going to look like. I'm also thinking that around supermarkets and other locations where people go shopping, we may find whole layers in the archaeological record marked by nitro gloves. Oh, we right. To discard those in the parking lot. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Just it, it kills me to think about all the stuff that is not biodegradable that we're not even thinking of right now. Oh, yeah. That sort of went right out the window when this all started, didn't it? It did. Yeah. Very interesting research. I appreciate you sharing this. Thanks. I was curious to know if anybody else was going to present at the SCA conference. Is there anybody out there? Yeah, <laughs> I did? was. Oh, you were? Okay. I thought I might have seen you in the list. Yeah. Yeah, I was. Uh, there was a symposium uh, in honor of Mark Robb, and since I spent some time with him out on San Clemente Island, and he was such a, uh, a generous scholar in terms of sharing ideas and things, uh, had a paper. Oh, okay. But, yeah, I don't know if we're going to, if the organizers are going to try and move it down the line or, or what. I haven't heard from him. Right, yeah. Yeah, it'd be I nice to... I, I'm sorry. I, I can't find my little raise hand thing. I'm so, so sorry. Oh, uh, that's okay. Um, I'm just going to interject here. Mark Rob was my advisor at Northridge. I did not know he passed. So did he pass? So you're, Tim, you're saying he passed then, huh? I uh, guess he did. He was, uh, yeah, he, um, he passed away um, well, probably about a year ago. Wow, wow. Oh, sorry to, very, very sorry to hear that. He was, I, he was a amazing, amazing uh, archaeologist, instructor, and mentor. So, On a wild man, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I had a question. Um, oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking too, when it comes to Clorox wipes as well, so the public, we're not able to get our hands on those wipes these days. And so, you know, if it was to continue for quite a while in the archaeological record, you look back, you'll see that households have those wipes and then they don't and they're just going to, you know, the medical field. Um, that would be interesting to see as well. I don't know if anybody else has, has their hands on wipes, but I can't get Clorox wipes right now. I can't either. I wonder if people who are hoarding them will discard them in bulk. And so you'll see lots of unused packages of yes. Yes. I don't need this anymore. They're dried out or something like that. 
Right, right. Or you excavate a home that where you have those hoarders, and it's like, why do they have a hundred cases of Clorox wipes? Right. <laughs> well, toilet paper. Yes, and toilet paper. What does it say about these people? I hope that toilet paper is biodegradable. <laughs> anyway, yeah. hopefully we won't see that in another, you know. And one other well, question I have for you, Kevin, years. <laughs> sure. Uh, is uh, did you do um, did you look at the collection at the San Diego Archaeological Center that the bottles? Did you do research on those or no? I did. Yeah, I um, was working on the ballpark collection. Ah. Fantastic. Do you have, so um, I'm an uh, instructor, archaeology instructor at Palomar, um, and do you, ha how would I be able to access your, your research or students uh, access your research when it comes to the bottles? Uh, well, I have my thesis on the San Diego State Library. Um, I used to be able to Google it, but now I think you have to go on the library search function. Okay. And um, yeah, and it's kind of a, a long title. Um, I think if when you put in like American, Victorian, and pro progressive era medicine <laughs> and Kathy Collins or Catherine Collins, you should be able to find it. Okay. And you, they don't have a copy at the center? Um, I'm not sure. Is there, Dante, do you know? I'm yes, guessing. Offhand, but we guessing no. <laughs> We could look it up for you, Betsy, if we do. Thank you. That would be fantastic. Yeah, and I've got all the data on every single bottle. So I've got the date ranges and all that stuff. And wow. you know what's interesting is that the, like, I haven't done any really large, uh, well, except for maybe at work, we've, we've done a lot of research on bottles, but as far as like Clorox, I didn't see a lot of Clorox bottles or like um, bleach bottles in the ballpark collection. No. Um, but maybe it was too early because I feel like the date range for that is a, like pre-1900 mainly for the bottles. Right, right. So maybe there's a lot, not a lot of that in that like 1937 and 1953 range. Right, right. What was the majority, what did you see at the ballpark? Um, there was a lot of patent medicine that was I always get a really good laugh out of patent medicine, like reading the labels, right, like right, right. Uh, Mustang, um, what was it called? Mustang oil or something like that. It was made out of tar mm -hmm. and um, some, some, like some three things that you shouldn't be ingesting into your body. And I remember what they were. It was like tar, motor oil, and something oh, else. <laughs> uh, so that was, I got a good laugh out of the different like mm -hmm. embossed brands and things mm -hmm. like that. Yes, um, yes. Yeah, a lot of like liquor bottles, um, a lot of perfume bottles. Uh, mm -hmm. They were really beautiful um, perfume bottles. Mm -hmm. um, like probably one of the most interesting collection of bottles that I've ever seen. Right, right. Were you able to um, look at, you know, uh, compare the sites of the ballpark to, um, to the bottles? Did you see um, any type of patterning of where you found specific types of bottles? Um, I, I didn't compare the ballpark, but in my thesis, I compared, um, several different sites, um, just focusing on the medicine bottles. Yeah. Uh, uh so I, I did that with the Nate Harrison site. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a, a site downtown, um, called the uh, melting pot that I think, um, Steve Van Warmer, uh, mm -hmm. wrote about. Okay. And uh, so I had a few different sites that I compared uh, just based on the medicine. Right. Um, but I, I didn't compare the um, ballpark yet, but um, it'd be interesting. You know who did that is uh, Doug Mengers. His, his okay. thesis covers a lot of the downtown sites. Okay. A, okay. a lot more extensively because okay. he was doing like a cross comparison of uh, many, many different sites. And I did about like um, eight to 10 sites just okay. focusing on the medicine. Right. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Can you uh, follow up on your idea of marketing and the archaeological record? Are, are you saying to look at old uh, newspapers and magazines uh, to find that or what? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it was kind of uh, Dr. Malios, Seth Malios was my thesis chair, and he kind of um, inspired me to do that where like if you find a maker's mark, 
uh, you can either go into like Google Books and find some of the old magazines or the archives for the San Diego Union and you get an idea of where they're going with the marketing what is their kind of like look and um, what are what are their sales points and things like that so yeah I think it gives you more of a broader idea of what what they were doing with that particular product okay I'd like to make a comment and I have a question. This is Marilyn. Oh, okay, great. One of the things that I found sort of <laughs> amusing is uh, some of the details on the bottles. They started saying purified nature's way. And I thought, <laughs> oh my goodness, that's interesting. And also dated to assure strength. You know, there's, <laughs> there's some of the issues that we're still talking about today and they had already co-opted them. Uh, right, yeah. Um, and I wanted to ask you um, exactly where are you working with a certain unit in the, in the State Park District? Uh, Southern Service Center. Thank you. Enjoy yeah. this. It was great. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, it's nice working for the Southern Service Center because we get to go different places around Southern California that I wouldn't otherwise go to. <laughs> mm -hmm. Does anyone know who the archaeologist is for Old Town San Diego right now? Uh, well, there's a there's a lot of us actually. Oh, oh cool. Yeah, so there, <laughs> we've got uh, ten ten archaeologists on staff, and we kind of rotate around. So we did. Um, they just finished up with um, doing more uh, like accessibility compliance projects, mm -hmm. and then they're also doing a. We're calling it initial public use. It's on the corner of Taylor and Calhoun Street. You might have seen all the construction going on around there. There's going to be a, a new park. And um, it, there's there was a ton of artifacts that came out of there. So hopefully we'll be able to get some of that exhibited. Great. Lots of history going on in that area for sure. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, any last questions? If not, I want to say once again, thank you, Kathy, for presenting your research today. And thank you to everyone who attended today's brown bag sessions. Just as a reminder, our next session will be The Coming Storm Curation Crisis Continues with our director, Cindy Stankowski, and that will be on August 12th at 12 p.m. So thank you, everybody, for attending.